All right, well, thank you for everyone uh, who's in attendance. Uh, I know in these, I, I hate to use the word, but I'll use it, unprecedented times. Uh, it's, it's nice that we get to see so many people here and thank you Genevieve uh, and Maggie and everyone at the AAN for arranging this. Um, so uh, as Genevieve mentioned, I'm a movement disorders fellow, but I won't be talking to you today about movement disorders. Um, I did complete a behavioral neurology fellowship and so that's what we'll be focusing on today. So without further delay, um, kind of our roadmap for the talk. Uh, I'm gonna start with sort of my journey, uh, not only just to behavioral neurology, but also to neurology in general. Um, I, I think the majority of our attendees are medical students, uh, some of whom may be uh, trying to determine what specialty they might wanna go into. And so I, uh, probably the majority of this will be my journey into neurology. Uh, and then I'll kind of give an overview of what behavioral neurology is, and uh, then we'll kind of wrap up with some question and answers. So moving along. So I thought it would be a little bit overly dramatic uh, to start with the year that I was born. So I started with 1996. Um, 1996 to 2009, because that's uh, the time when I lived in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, so that's kind of the area that I refer to as home. And there were some important things that happened during that time uh, that have kind of led me to, to here. So, so everything really sort of started as far as my interest in neurology um, with my grandfather, who's pictured in the upper right hand uh, image. And I said that I wasn't going to talk about movement disorders, but if you look at his face and you look at his left hand, I don't know how well you can see that that's a little blurry. Uh, that's because he had a tremor in his left hand. Um, so my uh, grandfather had Parkinson's disease and I was always kind of fascinated, obviously sad, but fascinated with how um, the disease affected the individual. So seeing that something wrong with the brain, with the nervous system could affect the way that someone moves, the way someone talks, uh, the way someone behaves. And so hearing about my grandfather was really the catalyst. Um, so moving along, I attended college at the University of Tennessee, which is also in Knoxville, Tennessee. And so that's why there's a football field uh, down in the bottom right image. And while I was at UT, I did some basic science research. Um, and that's why there's a fruit fly on here. Uh, so that was really kind of my first uh, dipping of my toe into the research waters and uh, really kind of led me down a track which I think will become a little bit more evident uh, in the next slide but I uh, got interested in how the brain works um, so not just the the clinical aspect but really what's the underlying mechanism of how things work and um, you know fruit fly is a very common model organism that we use to understand those types of things. And then in the top left-hand image um, is a man, his name's John Doherty, and he is really the first neurologist that I got to shadow. And I mentioned him for a couple of reasons. One is, I think shadowing um, at the level of a student or even earlier is an invaluable experience. Um, you know, we talk about informed consent when we're trying to, uh, you know, patient to, to agree to do something, you know, whether it's a procedure or whatnot. And informed consent means that you've got to be informed. And I, I find that oftentimes, uh, maybe even myself included, I say, oh, that sounds like something I'd like to do. And you sign up for it and you don't really know what you're getting into. Um, so it's important to be informed. So kudos to, to you all for uh, coming to this specialty section. Uh, and, and other specialty sections to learn about what behavioral neurology is, because I think uh, there are some misnomers that I hope to dispel a little bit. But uh, Dr. Doherty, um, I got to shadow him and ultimately work with him in his memory clinic um, shortly after I graduated college. And it was there that I was really introduced to the neurologic examination, which uh, just fascinated me. Um, and got to see the cognitive side of neurology. Um, mostly, it uh, was a lot of patients with Alzheimer's disease, but saw frontotemporal dementia and Crutchfield-Jacobs disease. So I got to see some really interesting things that just further piqued my curiosity. Um, so I was kind of building this case in my mind that I was going to do something neuro. Now, whether or not it turned out to be 
um, uh, neurology or neurosurgery or neuroradiology or a basic science uh, uh, neuroscientist. I think the, the jury was still out at that time, but all these things were kind of coming to, together to build what I, I think is a fairly nice story. So after I graduated college, I went to the uh, NIH in Washington, DC and worked at the National Institute for Deafness and Communication Disorders. And here I, I have a mouse up here because I moved on to bigger model organisms. I started using mice. I was working in a neurophysiology lab and this just gave me another level of granularity to understand how the brain works. Um, I was doing, if, if you're familiar, um, I was doing uh, patch plant physiology. So we basically get to record directly in uh, whatever cell you're interested in. And I was looking at a group of cells uh, within the brain, studying different receptor compositions. And so you actually got to see the neurons doing what the neurons do and you give them different um, scenarios, uh, different chemicals, neurotransmitters, and see how they behave. So you really get to see the physiology uh, right there in front of you. And I fell in love with the research process and just the, the underlying physiology of, of neuroscience there even more. Um, so it kind of strengthened the, the love for research. This was also just a great time after college to enjoy a new place. I mean, I moved from Tennessee, so I got to see all the things that Washington DC has to offer and get to work with a great group of people. So it, it was uh, an invaluable experience. But <clears throat> after that came the tough work. Uh, as many of you, uh, I think many of you are in med school now, so uh, not a piece of cake, but um, I went to, East Tennessee State University, uh, that's and, Johnson. and um, it's the Quillen College of Medicine. And so going into medical school, I was still kind of on the fence for what sort of neuro I wanted to do. No doubt I wanted to do neuro, but it wasn't clear what I wanted to do. So again, I uh, found different shadowing opportunities, um, tailored my clerkships to get exposure and kind of start checking things off the list. Um, and uh, I, I'll only say this on, um, on a, a, a chat where there are a lot of people interested in neurology, but I was on my uh, neurosurgery clerkship and I remember the surgery, it was a pretty intricate surgery and I was you know, thinking this is something I might wanna do, but it was a pretty intricate surgery. I wasn't scrubbed in because I was an early medical student and I had on one of the, the uh, um, lead vests uh, because they were using fluoro. And you know, operating rooms tend to be pretty cold, but if you have on a lead vest and you're not scrubbed in, you can kind of tuck your, tuck your hands under the vest and get nice and cozy. And if the situation's right, you might actually fall asleep. And um, I couldn't see much what was going on. And so the images were actually up on a television screen. So it was almost like I was just watching a movie. And fortunately, the only person that caught me was the anesthesiologist. The anesthesiologist. But um, before that, I was not a believer that people could sleep while they're standing up, but now I am. Um, so it was that day that I figured out I probably wasn't going to do neurosurgery. And, um, you know, similar, not, not totally similar stories, but helped to steer me away from the other specialties and towards neurology. And really the big thing was the exam. So going back to what I mentioned earlier, getting exposure to the intricacies of the neurologic examination, which I think is just, it's a beautiful thing to be able to, to lay your hands on the patient and figure out where the problem is. Um, and then uh, through that help to inform what the problem is. Um, but getting to develop long-term relationships with your patients, um, getting to sit in the room and listen to their story and figure out what the problem is in the room. Um, and I found, and this is, you know, maybe true, maybe not, but in my mind, I felt like the majority of the problem solving for a neurologist happened at the bedside. You're figuring out what the problem is. Whereas on the neurosurgery side, I felt like most of the problem solving was taking place in the operating room, you know, figuring out how to fix something manually. And for me personally, um, I, I uh, was geared more towards the former. So during medical school, I, um, I, I carved out opportunities to get more exposure to neurology. Um, that uh, middle picture at the top there is with uh, a few people 
um, actually there there were uh, authors on a uh, neurology interest group that I started. Um, and it was just a way of bringing other people together and uh, talking about something that was interesting. Uh, during medical school, I also got married. Um, not an easy time to get married, but you know, you, you take the plunge at some point and um, it's worked out very well so far. Um, also got a dog and the best time I found to get a dog was the last month of uh, medical school um, when you can learn to uh, potty train it and all that good stuff. So after medical school, or I, actually I should say in my fourth year of medical school, I did a clerkship, um, a, uh, an away rotation, and I would highly encourage everyone to do that. I remember when I was in medical school, I heard people say, uh, you know, some people said, yes, you've got to do a clerkship at, you know, an institution where you might want to go for residency or no, you definitely don't want to do that. And people felt pretty strongly in both directions. And I found that the people that, that said you shouldn't do it, um, the, the reasoning was um, if you don't do well, then there's no way they'll take you on uh, as a resident. And in my mind, I, I think, you know, you're going to go visit a place, you're going to you know, perform to the best of your abilities. And um, what better way to have informed consent than to spend a month at a place. And so um, I did an away rotation at the Mayo Clinic in Florida, and it worked out, whoops, uh, it worked out, um, well, very well for me, uh, because I ended up going there for my residency. Um, and that's in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I did my, as many of you may know, a neurology residency starts out with your first year in internal medicine and then years two, three, and four are in adult neurology. Um, pediatric neurology is a little bit different. Um, so Jacksonville was a great place to do a neurology residency um, and especially for someone who uh, was kind of interested at that time in behavioral neurology and movement disorders, which I still am to this day. Um, Mayo Jacksonville has a lot of nice things to do and I think it speaks to kind of the work-life balance. There's a great beach there, there's sports teams, there were other things to do um, to help keep that balance and I liked it so much that I stayed there for my behavioral neurology fellowship uh, from 2019 to 2020. I just graduated uh, a couple of years ago or um, last year or earlier this year rather. Um, so then uh, just a few other things that during residency I was able to do that I would just kind of speak to. Um, the top middle picture is from Neurology on the Hill. So um, the AAN has a lot of opportunities for people to get involved um, from the education side, um, from the research side, and from the advocacy side of things. And Neurology on the Hill is just a great way of interacting with other people uh, within the AAN, learning about policy, learning about um, how legislation is passed, and finding things that are important to us as neurologists um, that we need to lobby our congressmen and women about. And uh, so it's a great, great experience. Another thing that uh, the American Academy of Neurology has is the Palatucci Advocacy Leadership Forum. And in the top right picture, I was uh, fortunate enough to attend this. This is another just way, great way that the AAN helps to nurture those people that are interested in um, uh, trying to be advocates, not only for their patients, but also for uh, their colleagues in the um, field of neurology too. So great opportunities. Um, if you do end up choosing neurology, I would strongly suggest that you seek out these opportunities as early as your um, uh, residency. I, I did uh, some of these things uh, even in my PGY2 year, so I'm never too early. Um, some other things that I was able to do during residency as well is teach. Um, I, I like the research side. I, I love learning about problems and learning what the answers are to those problems, but I really enjoy teaching about the nervous system as well. And I had uh, ample opportunity to do that. Um, so I would encourage you to do that as well because um, they say uh, you can really show that you understand something if you're able to teach it. Um, so teach as much as you can. And uh, this is just another slide emphasizing kind of the work-life balance. During residency, I was able to, you know, enjoy the beach and different uh, things like uh, baseball spring training uh, with my wife. And uh, just last year, had my uh, first child, a little baby girl, Addison. So 
Um, it's very important, you know, I think um, if you're like me, there's that type A personality where you are hyper-focused on moving forward in your career. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's very important to maintain a, um, a healthy work-life balance um, and, and keep your friends and family close. And that brings me to the present. So uh, as Genevieve mentioned, I'm a uh, Movement Disorders Fellow at Mayo in Rochester. We just got here a couple months ago and um, things are off to a good start. So uh, that's kind of the end of the journey up to now. And uh, so let's move into what behavioral neurology is because I think that that's really uh, what everyone is most interested in. So behavioral neurology it kind of sounds like your patients have done something bad, like they are misbehaving or something. And quite frankly, I don't like that it's called behavioral neurology because if you try to have a conversation with someone that's not in medicine, you have to dispel all these you know, stigma that comes with the name of behavioral neurology. I think cognitive neurology might sound better, but uh, it's called behavioral neurology. So that's what we'll deal with. Um, I, I got some of my information about sort of what behavioral neurology is from a, uh, a PDF that the AAN put out about 20 years ago, but I found that most of it was still accurate. So a behavioral neurologist deals with neural processes associated with mental activity, subsuming cognitive functions, emotional states, and social behavior. Um, and these types of impairments can come from a variety of causes. I think most often individual or people will associate behavioral neurology with dementia. And that's probably the majority of what I see in behavioral neurology. But there are many other things uh, that can cause uh, cognitive impairment or behavioral abnormalities. And then sort of on that same, uh, same line of thinking, uh, neurodegeneration is a very common thing that we see. So diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. But we always have to remember that there are many other things that can cause cognitive impairment. Um, and I just listed a few uh, examples down at the bottom. Uh, vascular insults, so strokes can cause cognitive impairment, um, various infections, uh, traumas, uh, autoimmune conditions. Um, and I don't know if anyone is familiar with NMDA receptor encephalitis, but uh, I would encourage you to either read the book uh, that I show there called Brain on Fire, um, or check out the movie. I think it may be on Netflix, um, but it kind of gives you an idea of what some of the autoimmune conditions uh, that we see can look like. Um, and uh, they can affect people at any ages. So um, very, very interesting types of clinical presentations. Um, very sad when you see them, but fortunately we have pretty good treatments for them. Uh, so people can have just a dramatic turnaround um, as the uh, author of this book did. Um, so I'd encourage you to check that out if you haven't. Um, other things, uh, metabolic disturbances, so kidney dysfunction, liver dysfunction, all sorts of things can uh, affect how people think and behave. Um, cancers can do it. Um, changes in our uh, cerebral spinal fluid can do it. And trauma can do it too. And so I'll um, put in a plug for another movie down in the bottom left, uh, Concussion, uh, came out just a few years ago with uh, Will Smith. Uh, and it's about the discovery of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, so many of you may be uh, familiar with that. And if you're not, I'd uh, encourage you to put that on your to watch list because um, it's a very interesting story and, and certainly relevant. So cognitive domains. Uh, I don't know that everyone has heard the term cognitive domain. So um, the... Um, the DSM-5 splits up cognition into these six domains, uh, social cognition, complex attention, executive function, learning and memory, language, and perceptual motor. I don't think this is uh, entirely intuitive. Um, and when we start to administer various types of, of tests, I apologize if you're here in my chair, it's a squeaky one. Um, but when we're administering tests, uh, usually the cognitive domains that we're looking at something more like this. So orientation, where is somebody? Um, do they know, are they oriented to, to people, to where they're at, what the date is? Attention, so the ability to attend to information. Executive function, so kind of complex problem solving, learning and memory, um, our language function, and then visual spatial skills. That kind of wraps up the, uh, the cognitive domains as I like to think about them. 
So this is a little bit more information uh, taken from uh, the AAN's, um, uh, one of the AAN websites. Um, and it kind of, I like how it divides up behavioral neurology into sort of three syndromes. So the first is diffuse and multifocal disorders that affect cognition and behavioral uh, and behavior. Um, and so that could be a delirium or a dementia uh, is a good example. And then you have to figure out what's causing those types of things. But then you can also have neurobehavioral syndromes that are associated with focal lesions, um, such as aphasia, which is a, a, a deficit in language function, or amnesia, which is an issue with memory, or agnosia, difficulty um, naming things, or apraxia, difficulty tearing, uh, carrying out um, learned tasks. And um, if you're not familiar with those terms, um, I would encourage you to read basically any book by Oliver Sacks, quite frankly, but this is one of his most famous books um, called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And I think his books are just excellent uh, stories, they're all true, but excellent stories about how complex um, behavioral neurology can be. And you'll just read absolutely fascinating, seemingly bizarre, but fascinating stories about um, what happens when the nervous system goes awry. So um, more, more good things to do. And I will say, um, when I was on the interview trail um, in my fourth year of medical school, I think I listened to three or four Oliver Sacks books, uh, you know, audio books. So that's a great time to kind of catch up on your reading for those folks in med school that might have not opened up anything other than a medical textbook for the past few years. Um, so the last syndrome is neuropsychiatric manifestations of, manifestations of neurologic disorders. So uh, patients can have depression, mania, psychoses. I mean, there are, there's a laundry list of examples here, but um, personality changes, obsessive compulsive disorders, and those can accompany other neurological disorders like epilepsy. So people that are having seizures. Um, people that have had strokes, um, people with traumatic brain injury, or even multiple sclerosis. So things can get very complicated, and behavioral neurology is not just dealing with people that have dementia due to a neurodegenerative cause. Oh, where did my mouse go? There we go. So a behavioral neurologist versus a general neurologist. I think this is a nice distinction to make because you go through residency for neurology, you complete it and you pass your boards and you could go out and practice the next day. Um, but some people choose to subspecialize in, in an area such as behavioral neurology. And I think it's important to know why and sort of what you should expect to get if you're subspecializing. So a behavioral neurologist should be an expert in functional behavioral neuroanatomy. So being able to localize the things that I mentioned earlier um, to figure out where in the nervous system something's going wrong. And only then do you have a chance of figuring out what's actually causing the problem. Um, they should be experts at administering and interpreting mental status examinations. Um, many of you have probably used uh, mental status screens like the MMSE or the MOCA. Um, but there are many of those tests as well. Um, you're supposed to be an expert in the neurochemical basis and the pharmacological management of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral disturbances. And this gets very complicated. Um, anyone that's looked at a list of antidepressants recently um, and seen that there are uh, probably more than a dozen recognizes how complicated uh, this can get and why one person responds on one SSR, SSRI versus another. Um, so as you can start to see, there's a fair amount of overlap between psychiatry and behavioral neurology too. Um, and fundamental, this kind of is, dovetails off of that, but fundamental knowledge is required in the epidemiology of diseases, the natural history, developmental context, molecular genetics, uh, the pathophysiology, comprehensive clinical management, and prognosis across the range of the neurobehavioral syndromes and disorders. So, this cartoon, I think it's kind of funny and annoying at the same time, uh, but this is sort of the stereotype of, that was given to neurologists for such a long time. So it says the armchair intellectual, where you see with the onset of dysarthria and ipsilateral Horner syndrome and diminished sensation to the contralateral body, we can isolate this stroke to the posterior circulations, specifically lateral medullary infarct. What can you do now? Nothing, but it's still fascinating, isn't it? 
And, you know, we do get to see a lot of fascinating, um, fascinating things with how, uh, how the brain works. Um, you know, we, we understand more about how the brain works when we see what happens when it's not functioning correctly. But, you know, we have to remember that when we're seeing the brain not functioning correctly, that means that there's a person in front of us that's dealing with some sort of a disease. Um, and so I, I think for a long time, uh, maybe neurology was viewed in this, this way, and it was probably difficult for some people to have fulfillment. Um, if you go through your day just making diagnoses and then uh, not being able to offer anything for them. But uh, fortunately, no, neurology is no longer that type of a specialty. But I will say that some people feel like behavioral neurology is still that type of specialty. But I hope to convince you otherwise today. So behavioral neurologist, um, there's no such thing as, or there shouldn't be uh, such a thing as a team of one anymore when it comes to medicine. Medicine is just too complex. And so it's important to surround yourself with a good and competent team. So my team as a behavioral neurologist um, includes nurses. Uh, it's great to have uh, good nurses uh, that, that uh, know what they're talking about, know what they're doing, and are just fun to be around because it makes the work balance or the, um, uh, the work environment just much more enjoyable. Um, we work very closely with our neuropsychologists. So while I may do a cognitive screen in my office, such as the, the short test of mental status, our neuropsychologists are gonna be administering much more detailed cognitive assessments um, so that we can really nail down where a problem is within the nervous system. Um, so we have a very close working relationship with them. Our radiologists, specifically our, our neuroradiologists, because as you'll see uh, in the upcoming slides, we see a lot of complicated neuroimaging. We'll see um, MRIs and PET scans, and it's really important to have a, a neuroradiologist that you feel comfortable calling up and, and discussing a scan uh, because these can get really complex really quickly. Um, social workers are also an invaluable resource uh, to our practice. Um, we also work with therapists. Um, I, I, I call it the, uh, the trifecta, the speech therapy, occupational therapy, and physical therapy. Oops, I put speech therapy on there twice, but speech therapy, occupational, and physical therapy. And then also palliative care, uh, because we do see a lot of patients with neurodegenerative diseases, and palliative care is a very important part of what we do um, uh, and, and consult out to as well. So what are our tools that we use? It's not all that uh, dissimilar from other neurologists, but I, I do want to take a moment, especially since the majority of our audience is med students, um, I, I want to talk about that a little bit. So back to the neuropsychological testing. The basis for neurology um, and the way that I learned it is that our number one, when, we're, when we uh, come up to a patient, uh, our number one question is, is this problem neurologic? If the answer is no, then you're probably not the consultant that the patient needs to be seeing at the moment. But if you say yes, then you move on to the second issue. And the question is, where in the nervous system is the problem? And I've mentioned that a couple of times, that that's really, uh, you know, figuring out what the problem is, is really predicated on figuring out where the problem is. And neuropsychological testing helps us to do that almost, I would say, probably better than any other modality that we have. And the goal is to really drill down onto the different cognitive domains to figure out the areas of the brain that are abnormal. And I'll use an example. One of our most common complaints um, for, for patients that I see in the clinic is memory. They'll say, you know, I can't remember things anymore. I keep forgetting X, Y, and Z. And, and I tell people that memory gets picked on a lot. So there's a tried and true issue with memory uh, there can be a tried and true issue with memory, but there are also a lot of other things that have to be functioning properly for you to be able to remember something as well. So one of the, the best examples that I tell people is, you know, I, I go to the grocery store, my, my wife gives me a, a, a honeydew list that's got, you know, 20 dozen things on it that I've got to get at the grocery store. I pull up to the grocery store, I park my car, um, I, I walk into the grocery store, get everything on the list, walk out into the parking lot, and I can't find my car. I've totally forgotten where I parked my car. But 
I, I don't have a memory issue, or at least I don't think I have a memory issue. The issue was that when I was going in to the grocery store, I was thinking about everything else that I needed to do. My body was parking the car and getting out of the car and walking into the grocery store, but my mind was totally somewhere else. And so sometimes that, that can be referred to as an issue with attention. You have to attend to the information that you're supposed to remember before you ever have a chance to remember it. You know, it's, it's like if you, um, if you want to deposit, or excuse me, if you want to withdraw money from your bank account, if you never deposited money in your bank account, you're probably not going to get much money. So that's just one example of, of, of things that neuropsychological testing can help to tease apart because that same person or me, um, you know, if they're forgetting where they parked their car and they have an issue with attention, if they take a test like the mini mental status examination or the, the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or the short test of mental status or the St. Louis mental status exam, there are a bunch of these, they're going to miss the memory words. And if you see that they've missed the memory words and say, oh, it's a problem with memory, that could lead you down the very wrong path. Um, that can make you start thinking that someone might have Alzheimer's disease when it's just an issue of attending to the right information. And so neuropsychological testing is very helpful for teasing that apart. Another thing when it comes to neurodegenerative diseases, um, the localization is very important. So I put this example up on the slide um, where um, in typical Alzheimer's disease, as many of you may know, uh, memory tends to be the cognitive domain that's affected earliest and most severely. And so from this cognitive profile, and I really like how they've laid it out here, um, you can see, I don't know if you can see my curve, but you can see that nonverbal memory is pretty impaired, um, but other, and, and verbal memory is pretty impaired, but all these other cognitive domains are relatively uh, intact. That cognitive profile, and this visual representation really helps you to see it, is vastly different from someone with a frontal version of Alzheimer's disease. That, that image looks different, very different. Or someone with a different variant, like logopenic variant, primary progressive aphasia, which is a variant of Alzheimer's disease. Or someone with posterior cortical atrophy, which is also a variant of Alzheimer's disease, whereby patients might have more of an issue with their visual spatial skills rather than memory or, um, or executive function. So neuropsych testing, very important. So it's very important to have a good working relationship with your neuropsychologist. Fluid. Um, so just like most other uh, specialties in medicine, we do rely heavily on a number of blood tests. Um, and so depending on the clinical context, we may be checking typical things things like blood counts and thyroid and liver function. Um, but we also might look at rheumatological labs or autoimmune labs. Cerebrospinal fluid, uh, some people joke it's like the blood uh, for a neurologist uh, because it gives us an up close and personal look at what's going on in the nervous system. So we can look for white blood. It might indicate that there may be an inflammatory process in the uh, nervous system. We can look for cancer cells. Uh, we can look for autoantibodies, such as the NMDA receptor antibody that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so spinal fluid is a valuable, valuable um, part of our, our clinical evaluation. But one other thing that we can look for in our uh, spinal fluid is biomarkers of disease. And this is one uh, piece of evidence uh, showing that um, how, let me back up. So this is a little bit of evidence showing how the field of behavioral neurology has moved forward in our ability to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. So if we were having uh, you know, this conversation 20, 30 years ago, um, you see someone in the clinic, they're forgetful, it's been going on for a few years, you say, yeah, it's probably Alzheimer's disease, um, we don't need to do any testing, end of story, um, here's a medication, why don't you give it a try? And that's it. And we know that you can't diagnose it 100% um, until someone goes to an autopsy post-mortem. And obviously, uh, post-mortem diagnosis doesn't do someone that's still living very much good. So we have biomarkers of disease. And this is a very hot area of research because if we can diagnose a disease earlier, a neurodegenerative disease earlier, then essentially we can catch it at a time uh, when it's not 
uh, the symptoms are not as severe. And so hopefully we can halt uh, progression of the disease and uh, it, it really opens us up to a lot of opportunities, not only for treatment uh, and research, but hopefully one day finding a cure. But this is one example of some of the data that we might get. We look for the hallmark um, uh, abnormal proteins that we see in Alzheimer's disease. And those happen to be uh, amyloid and uh, tau. And so uh, this is, uh, I believe this is from Athena uh, Diagnostics. Uh, you send them some spinal fluid and then they'll kind of plot based on the levels of the amyloid and tau, what the likelihood is that the person has Alzheimer's disease. Um, so this is a game changer. This really is a game changer because many uh, diseases, many neurodegenerative diseases can look like Alzheimer's disease, but aren't Alzheimer's disease. And on the previous slide where I showed you the neuropsychological testing, I showed you there's a frontal version of Alzheimer's disease. That's oftentimes misdiagnosed as frontotemporal dementia, which is a very different clinical entity. Um, and then the other uh, uh, variants can be misdiagnosed as well. So this is really um, helping to move the field forward and increase our accuracy in diagnoses. Um, a behavioral neurologist will also use different neurophysiological tools. Depending on the clinical context, you may order an EEG um, to look at an individual's brainwave that may help you to localize things, but there are also certain diseases where they might have characteristic patterns on their EEG, such as Crutchfield-Jakob's disease or the, the prion disease. Um, some individuals where you uh, may be concerned about frontotemporal dementia, we may also look for uh, things that go along with frontotemporal dementia, such as motor neuron disease or ALS. And so uh, it's important to have a good working knowledge of those types of tools as well. Oftentimes people think a behavioral neurologist isn't gonna see an EMG um, or an EEG, but you might. Uh, uh, when the clinical situation warrants it. And as I mentioned earlier, imaging uh, is going to be important really for any neurologist. Uh, behavioral neurologists, um, uh, you know, MRI is, is kind of the bread and butter um, for looking for structural abnormalities. In the case of neurodegenerative diseases, we'll look for um, patterns of, of uh, brain atrophy that help to steer us towards and away from certain diagnoses. And so I'll, I've kind of touched on it a little bit, but I just want to go in the direction of neurodegenerative diseases for a moment because this is the majority of, of what I see um, and it's sort of where my passion lies. And um, it's a good, a good opportunity to kind of show some examples of more tools that we use. So besides MRI, which is really a structural measure of the brain, we also perform different functional measures of the brain, uh, mostly in the form of PET scans. And so we have a few different types of PET scans that we're using in prime time today. Um, FDG PET looks at um, the brain's ability to metabolize glucose. And so whereas a oncologist may be looking for areas of hypermetabolism because you have uncontrolled cellular growth, a behavioral neurologist, especially in neurodegenerative diseases, would look for areas of hypometabolism um, that would indicate there are certain areas of the brain that are not functioning at the level that other areas are. And uh, you'd be surprised that an MRI of the brain might look stone cold normal, but the FDG PET shows you a, a pattern that's classic for Alzheimer's disease or another neurodegenerative disease. So this is a very important um, uh, tool that we use. In 2006, a new kind of PET scan was approved, an amyloid, uh, one that is able to detect amyloid deposition. Um, and think back, amyloid being one of the abnormal proteins in Alzheimer's disease. So we actually have the ability to put someone in a scanner and see where amyloid deposition is occurring in their brain. This is another example of a biomarker and just shows how far we've come in the field. And we've got a similar thing uh, with, uh, with tau imaging as well that's really just being used for research purposes, but um, great example of how the field is moving forward. Um, and uh, I, I've mentioned it a few times, but I just, I hope everyone understands how big of an issue neurodegenerative diseases are um, in our country and in the world, uh, frankly. Um, the top left graph is showing the uh, prevalence of Alzheimer's disease 
in the United States. And you'll notice in 2010, it was 4.7 million. Uh, in 2050, it's predicted to be 13.8. So it truly is an epidemic. And th this is the prediction if nothing changes. But I would argue that our understanding, thanks to a lot of the biomarkers that we've developed, um, I think that we're gonna be able to, uh, this is another cliche, flatten the curve a little bit um, on Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then one other thing that I'll mention, um, the bottom left picture is uh, Glenn Campbell. He was a, for those of you who don't know, he was a famous uh, country artist who had Alzheimer's disease. But I would imagine most of you recognize the face in the upper right as Robin Williams. And he had a different disease. But uh, at one point in time, he was diagnosed with um, several different things. I think uh, as far as diagnoses go, um, he may have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Some of the things that he was dealing with kind of looked like Parkinson's disease. Some of the other things he looked like, um, uh, other things that he was diagnosed with kind of looked like depression. And when it came down to it, he had a disease called LBD or Lewy body dementia, which is the second most common uh, cause of dementia. Uh, and it's oftentimes misdiagnosed. But that's another example of a neurodegenerative disease that we see, and it just goes to show how complex these diseases are. But each one of the neurodegenerative diseases seems to have sort of a flavor. And the more you see it and the more we develop uh, reliable biomarkers, you can start to get, get a better feel for what these flavors are. Um, and I, I think it's a really exciting time to be in the field uh, because we're learning more about these diseases at a rapid rate. Um, this shows what happens in Alzheimer's disease, and I know for the sake of time, I'll kind of move through this quickly, but um, I think it's a, a good illustration of what we've learned about Alzheimer's disease. So um, this, you'll notice that on the y-axis, we have biomarker magnitude, and on the x-axis, we have clinical disease stage. I'll draw your attention to uh, the memory line, which is the purple line. Notice that that takes off well after the amyloid beta, the red line, or the tau line, which is the blue line, or the brain structure line, which is the first green line. This just goes to show that thanks to our biomarker studies, we have learned that these proteins are becoming deposited in the brain long before, 10, 20 plus years before clinical symptoms manifest. And so the theory is, and I, I think it's probably more than a theory, is that if we can develop better treatments, then we might be able to identify these patients before they ever develop symptoms. And if we intervene then, then we may be able to prevent them from ever developing symptoms. And so that's the hope of the field. And I think we're moving in the right direction there, um, largely in part to some of our efforts in genetics. Um, previously, when you talk about genetics related to Alzheimer's disease, everyone talks about APOE, APOE this, APOE that. Um, but we have found many, many, many genes that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. Um, from some of the more rare genes, as you'll see up in the, the upper left-hand corner of the graph, like presenilin 1 and 2 and APP, um, that uh, are passed on in an autosomal dominant fashion, all the way to numerous risk variants in the bottom right-hand uh, portion of the graph that infer a small risk of uh, developing Alzheimer's disease, but they can have a synergistic effect. And so each one of these genes, though, gives us a new insight into the disease process. And remember that a gene is ultimately uh, coding a protein, usually coding a protein, and those proteins are molecular machines that um, hopefully would uh, 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 reveal a druggable target. And so the work that we're doing in genetics, I think, is, is helping to propel the field forward as well. So um, lastly, treatment. Uh, so this goes back to sort of our armchair uh, expert. Um, uh, you can diagnose it, but you can't do much about it. For those diseases that are non-neurodegenerative, you obviously treat the underlying cause. Individuals with hypothyroidism may have cognitive impairment, and fortunately, the treatment is give them thyroid hormone. So sometimes it's as simple as that. But when we start to talk about neurodegenerative diseases, the role of a behavioral neurologist, from my point of view, 
is that you really get to join the patient on their journey. There's nothing easy about these diseases, um, but you come with a, a set of expertise where you can help to sort of peer around corners and tell people what they can expect moving forward. And when uh, patients and their caregivers have someone on their team that, that knows about these diseases and someone that they can contact, I, I think that it, uh, it makes the journey uh, a bit more bearable for them. And so, um, and that's one of the things that I think drew me to neurology in the first place is getting to have a, a long-term relationship with your patients and help them with what they're dealing with, not just giving them a pill. Um, symptomatic management. So we do have uh, treatments to help manage symptoms in some diseases. Aricept is a common medication that we may use. Um, and I mentioned palliative care earlier. Um, so palliative care is a subspecialty of neurology, or well, if you're a, neuro a neurological um, palliative care physician, it can be a subspecialty within neurology. And um, that's to help patients uh, plan. It's not the same thing as hospice. It's really looking at an individual that has a incurable disease or where um, disease modifying therapies are no longer being pursued. Um, so that can help patients to um, um, focus on quality of life rather than quantity of life. And then last thing, uh, I put clinicaltrials.gov on there because there are numerous clinical trials uh, going on right now in the field of say Alzheimer's, for example. Um, uh, some of you may be familiar with aducanumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against amyloid. Um, and uh, you can see the press release there just from a couple of weeks ago, the FDA has accept, uh, accepted its um, uh, license application. And so we may be moving forward with our first disease modifying therapy for Alzheimer's disease. So I think that the future looks bright for behavioral neurology. So hopefully um, you're, you're still interested in behavioral neurology because if you are, uh, it's important to know what the training is. And it comes in the form of a fellowship after uh, residency. You're going to incorporate into that. You don't have to incorporate any research, frankly. Um, but you can go into private practice or you can go into an academic setting. Um, both, both can happen. Um, and there is the option for a behavioral neurology board exam uh, that I'll actually be taking in November. Um, and so you would have to, to maintain that. But I did a quick search online and at least from the United Council for Neurologic Subspecialties, this makes it look like there's about 37 behavioral neurology programs in the country. There may be more or less because I don't know if this is the end all be all. But um, it just kind of gives you an idea of, of what the options are out there. So um, talked a little bit longer than I intended to, but um, we've got a few more minutes um, for questions. And I put my contact information uh, at the bottom. So feel free to contact me with any questions. I'd love to be a resource for you. Um, so uh, I'd like to open it up for any questions. And I do see there are some questions already in the chat, so that's great. Okay, let's see here. Um, all right, I see Dylan said, did you always plan on pursuing a fellowship in both behavioral neurology and movement disorders? It's not what inspired you. Yeah, uh, so good question. Um, I actually was originally just planning on doing a movement disorders. Uh, fellowship. It goes back to my grandfather and me being very interested in Parkinson's disease, but Parkinson's disease is also a neurodegenerative disease, and I, I quickly realized how many of the neurodegenerative diseases have symptoms that fall in both the behavioral and the movement sphere, and so I wanted to marry those two fellowships together to be a neurodegenerative expert, basically. Good question. Um, can you talk about the borders of your scope of practice and overlap with neuroimmunology, uh, autoimmune encephalitis, and psychiatry? Yeah, so my scope of practice is not representative right now because I'm a movement disorders fellow, but um, we work very closely with autoimmune neurologists, um, especially when we're dealing with rapidly progressive dementia. And so that's dementia, uh, someone goes like uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis, the brain on fire. That's a good example of a rapidly progressive dementia um, that's due to an autoimmune cause. And so we work very closely um, with our autoimmune neurology colleagues. 
And psychiatry, I think the, the lines are really blurred between psychiatry and behavioral neurology. Um, sometimes when I uh, run into a situation with a complex neurodegenerative disease and um, I feel like there may be comorbid psychiatric uh, disease, I will oftentimes consult a psychiatrist so that we can make treatment decisions together because a psychiatrist really has sort of an, another level of expertise when it comes to using a lot of those uh, drugs that um, uh, affect brain chemistry, like the different kinds of SSRIs and things like that. So um, I probably should have put psychiatrist on uh, the list of teams because we do work very closely together. That's a good question. Um, let's see, motivated the uh, fellowships. Looks like uh, Roxana had a similar question to uh, Dylan. So I hope I answered that question for you. And could you touch on your relationship with PM and R physicians? To what degree do you feel, do you deal with whoops, ADLs and occupation? Um, so PM and R, uh, I think probably go, uh, probably consult them more with movement disorders than I do with behavioral neurology. I think the one exception would be, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, when we're dealing with patients that have uh, frontotemporal dementia, there's a mutation called C9 ORF um, uh, 72 that is a linkage between ALS and frontotemporal dementia. And so those patients that also have motor neuron disease, and so they have significant uh, neuromuscular weakness uh, and things that go along with that, PMNR may have a role there, um, but oftentimes I'll be working closely with our neuromuscular neurologist to help um, those patients, and so they kind of uh, take the ball with that. Um, but uh, ADLs, when we talk about cognitive uh, effects, you know, we think about basic ADLs as far as is someone able to uh, bathe themselves, uh, put their clothes on, and feed themselves, and if those things are impaired, there might be a role for occupational therapy. Um, we'll oftentimes uh, get our social workers to help, um, you know, occupational therapy you can go out to the house and uh, make sure that the correct safety mechanisms are in place. So that, that speaks to our team uh, because uh, when a patient comes into my office, I, you know, if you put yourself in the shoes of someone who's going to see a behavioral neurologist, just for a moment, imagine, that you're starting to think that your thinking is not as clear or worse yet, maybe your, your child, your, your daughter or your son uh, is having concerns about your cognition and somehow they've convinced you to go see this doctor who's gonna delve into your cognition and figure out what's going on. That would be very disconcerting to me. And so you think about someone that's going to the doctor for high blood pressure, Sure, no one wants to necessarily go to the doctor, but it's a little bit different. When you start talking about someone's cognition and their emotions, you're really getting to that inner aspect of what makes them them. And so patients can oftentimes start to feel like they're under the microscope. And I tell them, you are under the microscope, but the goal is to one, make sure that they're safe and those people around them are safe. And two, is to figure out if there is a problem. And if there is, then trying to figure out what it is and figure out the best way of addressing it. So the, the ADLs, PMNR, that really gets to the safety uh, aspect of things. So thanks for asking that question. That's an important point. Um, how much, let's see, let me make sure I'm not, yeah. Okay, so Roxanne also said, how much overlap is there between behavioral neurology, neuropsychiatry, and other related fields? I think we've kind of touched on that a little bit. What kinds of patients or aspects of care are behavioral neurologists primarily responsible for? Yeah, so if it is a neurodegenerative disease, that's, I would say, kind of the bread and butter, at least of our practice. Um, so things like Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, there's a long list of those types of diseases. Um, if the problem is secondary, remember I showed those different syndromes earlier, if it's secondary to something like multiple sclerosis or strokes or cancer, we might be uh, asked to see the patient as a consultant, but ultimately those patients would go back to say their muscular, or, um, their multiple sclerosis doctor or their oncologist. 
Um, so it just kind of depends on, on the type of disease that you're dealing with and what it's causing the symptoms. And let's see, Catherine asked, are you currently participating in research and has there been a research requirement for your fellowships? So I am involved in research. In fact, after I finish my movement disorders fellowship, I'm gonna be returning to Mayo Clinic in Florida for a, um, a research fellowship. And research, depending on where you wanna go with your career, research can be a very important aspect. Um, if you wanna pursue a career in academics um, like I'm doing, uh, then research is something that you, you need to you need to put in some some time with. Um, I think the requirements, at least for neurology residency, is that you're involved in at least one scholarly activity during your time as a resident, um, and that could be anywhere. I mean, that could be presenting a poster at a meeting, which is is not not too difficult to do. Um, so you don't have to do too much, um, but. Uh, uh, that's not difficult to do, and depending on where you go I, uh, for neurology residency would dictate kind of what your resources are and what's available to you. So if you think that you're interested in research, I would encourage you to get involved in research, whatever it is. It doesn't even have to be in neurology because there's a certain skill set that comes along with doing high quality research that you can get no matter what you're researching. It's a certain way of thinking about things. And it kind of goes back to what I said earlier about informed consent. If you think you want to do research, figure out what that looks like before you set up your career trajectory to do research. Because the worst thing in the world is that you get 15 years, even five years down the road, you say, man, I hate research. Because um, you would have wasted a lot of time at that point. So get informed consent. Um, get involved with research projects, big or small. Uh, excellent question. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, if you're, if you want to look at some of the stuff that I've done, you can just kind of Google my, or not Google my name, but PubMed my name, uh, and there's some stuff in there. Um, let's see, before leaving, oh, nope, that's Genevieve. Uh, Jack says, what do you like the most about behavioral cognitive neurology as a subspecialty? What are your biggest struggles with subspecialty? The biggest struggle is that we don't have a cure um, for a lot of these diseases. Um, and the treatments, quite frankly, aren't, well, I mean, they're not miracle treatments, but I think if you, you recognize that you're on a journey with these patients, you really can't help them. Um, we have symptomatic management for a lot of these diseases and sometimes just talking to a patient or the caregiver can be um, tremendously fulfilling for them, but also for you. Um, so I, I think, you know, that might be the goal with whatever career you're pursuing is make sure that you find fulfillment in whatever you do and um, try to find enjoyment uh, because if you're going to work every day and dreading it, uh, you're going to live a miserable existence. But if you actually look forward to going to work and interacting with the people that you work with and interacting with the patients and getting to problem solve uh, complex diseases, I think you're going to have a happy time. Um, but one of the, you know, because the sort of limitations with treatment is a big frustration of mine, that's one thing that motivates me to go into research uh, because I want to try to help that problem. So if you can kind of take a frustration and turn it into motivation, I think that's also pretty good advice too. And the last one I see is how did you decide where to complete fellowship and how did you craft your multidisciplinary fellowship? So I kind of answered the last one already. Um, completing the fellowship, uh, it was very natural to go from neurology residency into the behavioral neurology fellowship uh, at Mayo, Florida, because I had met the people that I was going to work with. Um, I was already working on some research uh, with those people as well. And so it just worked out well for me. But um, same thing with Mayo Clinic Rochester, because I, I've done a lot of uh, research between uh, the two groups. We collaborate with each other. Um, but uh, so that's kind of how it worked for me. But I would just encourage you to, to try to network with people and figure out who you could see yourself working with. Um, going to meetings uh, is a great way of doing that and kind of rubbing shoulders with people figure out folks um, email addresses and just kind of get to know them. And one, you want to work with someone who knows what they're doing. Um, so, you know, looking for people that are competent uh, and well-established in the field uh, that they're working in, but, but then figuring out, you know, their personality. Is it someone that you can work with for a year? You know, 
Um, and that's kind of part of training programs uh, in general, whether it's your residency or fellowships. Um, there's something to be said for someone who's an expert in their field, but there's also something to be said for someone that you get along with too. Um, you know, if someone's an expert, but you're never going to get to interact with them or the interactions are so painful that you don't want to interact with them, then I would say doesn't really matter. So um, look for personality and competence, I would say. Great questions. Well, thank you so much. This was so informative. I know I learned something and I'm not even a medical student. So I'm sure the students are so thankful for your time and your knowledge that you just gave everyone. Um, in the chat, there is a short uh, assessment so we can give some feedback for Dr. Tipton today. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, ggates at aan.com. Um, and feel free to look out for future calls. Thank you so much, Dr. Tipton. We're so thankful to have you. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who attended. Thank you.